In this video, you'll learn how to harness the power of the sun for your Arduino projects. You might think, well, I'll just wire the solar panel to the Arduino VIN and let the onboard voltage regulator do the work. It might work, but it might also fry the Arduino if the voltage is too high. An easy way to regulate voltage is using a buck converter. If I add one into this circuit, the Arduino receives a steady voltage. It works. Well, until it doesn't. The solution, of course, is to add a battery. Unfortunately, if you add it directly into this circuit, it will charge either very slowly, if the voltage is low, or become overcharged and possibly explode if the voltage is high. What would really help here is if you controlled the buck converted voltage with the Arduino so that the charging happens at a steady rate and stops when the battery is full. And that's exactly what I'm going to show you how to do. I'll show you how to build a regulator that is essentially a controllable buck converter. A standard buck converter regulates voltage using three components. An integrated circuit that switches the voltage source on and off. An LC filter that reduces high frequencies in the output, and a feedback circuit that drives the steady output voltage. Let's look at how a switching circuit, like the one in a buck converter, works to regulate voltage. If the source is 24 volts and the switch is on, the output will be 24 volts. When off, the voltage drops to zero. If we switch rapidly between zero and 24 volts, with half the time spent at each level, the output will see an average of 12 volts. The fraction of time the PWM signal is on is known as the duty cycle. If we increase the duty cycle to 0.75, the average output voltage increases to 18 volts. Reduce the duty to 25%, and the average is 6 volts. Let's build the switching circuit using an IRF 9540N P-channel MOSFET. The P-channel MOSFET is placed on the high voltage side of the load. Controlling a P-channel MOSFET with an Arduino is a little tricky. Let me walk you through it. To turn the P-channel MOSFET on, we need the gate source potential difference to drop below negative 3 volts. Let's assume my 24 volt solar panel source. If we connect the Arduino output pin to the gate and write low, it will provide 0 volts implying that the gate to source voltage difference will be negative 24 volts, turning the MOSFET on. If we write high to the pin, it will provide 5 volts, so the voltage difference will be negative 19 volts, so the MOSFET is still on. With this setup, we can't turn the MOSFET off, so it's useless. To fix this issue, we'll add an NPN transistor that can be controlled by the Arduino, and use it to drive the MOSFET. Don't forget to add a current limiting resistor to protect the Arduino. To finish the driver circuit, we need a pull-up resistor so that the gate source potential difference is zero when the transistor is off. And less than negative three volts when the transistor is on. We need to be careful choosing the pull-up resistor. If it's too large, say 10K, not enough current flows into the MOSFET gate, which limits the viable switching frequencies. I found that a 1K resistor works for high frequencies like 10 kHz, but you need a higher wattage resistor if the input voltage is high. For my 24 volt solar panel, I'll use a 1 watt resistor. There's one final issue we need to iron out. The maximum gate source voltage of the 9540N is negative 20 volts. So with the panel providing 24 volts, I'll be over the MOSFET's rating. Not good. To fix this, I can add another resistor to divide the voltage. A 560 ohm resistor will drop about 9 volts, leaving a maximum gate source voltage of negative 15 volts, well within the rated limit of negative 20 volts. Now let's connect the Arduino and test it out. In the code, I'll use an analog write to create the input PWM signal to switch the transistor. 
Next, I'll add a voltage divider to safely measure the voltage across the load. I'll read the voltage from the divider using an analog read command, and then convert the result based on the resistors I used in the voltage divider. I'll complete the code by printing the voltage to the serial port so we can look at the result. Increasing the duty cycle will increase the average output voltage. Decreasing it has the opposite effect. The circuit we created so far will work for charging a battery, but contains many high-frequency switching harmonics that reduce its overall utility and make it harder to control. If we look at the FFT of the output, we see the desired DC component at 0 Hz, but we also see substantial unwanted switching harmonics. How does a buck converter handle these switching harmonics? It uses an LC filter. An LC filter works by storing charge in the capacitor when the voltage is high, and then releases it when the voltage is low. This smooths out the voltage curve. An LC filter can be understood through a Bode diagram, which shows the gain of the LC filter as a function of frequency. Here's the Bode plot for a 330 microhenry inductor and a 100 microfarad capacitor connected to a 10 ohm load. The first plot shows the magnitude of the response to different frequencies. At frequencies below 10 Hz, the magnitude is 0 decibels, leaving the signal largely unaffected. At 10 kHz, the magnitude is negative 40 decibels, so only 1% of a 10 kHz signal will remain. Notice that around 900 Hz, the magnitude is 15 decibels. This implies the signal will be amplified. You definitely do not want a PWM frequency near this peak as it will magnify the switching harmonics instead of attenuating them. The second plot in the Bode diagram shows the phase delay, but it's not relevant to our current discussion. Let's add the LC filter to our circuit and see if it reduces the switching harmonics. With the filter in place, I'm betting we'll see a nice, smooth voltage across the load. Huh, that didn't work very well. The problem is that the default PWM frequency of pin 9 is 490 Hz. This is outside the effective range of the LC filter, which filters frequencies above 5 kHz. To improve the response, you can adjust the PWM frequency delivered by the Arduino using the Timer 1 library. To use the Timer 1 library, add the header and call the initialize method in the setup. The input value sets the timer period in microseconds, so I'll set it to 100 to yield a frequency of 10 kHz. The PWM method sets the duty cycle. Unlike a typical analog write command, which accepts values from 0 to 255, the PWM method accepts values from 0 to 1023. I'll set this to half the max for 50% duty. Now let's run the code and see if the filter works at the new frequency. Perfect. We can see a little ripple in the output voltage, but most of the switching harmonics have been removed. If I set the duty cycle to vary with time, the output voltage will oscillate between steady high and low voltages over time. Note that if a large pull-up resistor like 10K is used in the MOSFET charging circuit, the viable range of the duty cycle will be reduced when the switching frequency is 10 kHz. When charging a battery, you typically want to control the current, so we also need a current sensor. I'll add in an INA219 because it gives very accurate readings up to 3 amps. I'm not going to go into detail on the INA219 setup or code. It's pretty simple. Add the library, Create an instance of the INA219 class, initialize the sensor, and then read the current. You can also read the voltage. Now we can monitor the current flowing through the load as the duty cycle changes.
With the charging circuit complete, we can write code to control the charging rate. Here's how the PID controller is set up. First, I'll set a target current. Then, I'll take the difference between the target and the INA219 current measurement to obtain the error. The PID controller will then compute the control signal, which is used as a duty cycle of the PWM signal driving the MOSFET. If the current is low, the controller will drive up the duty cycle, increasing the current. If the current is high, the duty cycle will be lowered. I'm not going to explain the details of the PID control code, but I will highlight the important bits and show you how to use it. Here's the class I wrote for simple PID control. The constructor sets default PID parameters. The setParams method allows you to adjust them. The eValu method computes the control signal U, using the target and measured values as inputs. Here's where the error is computed, and here's the control signal U, computed as a sum of the three PID terms, proportional, integral, and derivative. If you want more detail on how PID control works, you can watch my video on PID position control. I wrote this class in a separate header file, so start by including that in the main Arduino program. Then instantiate an instance of the simple PID class. Inside the setup function, use the setParams method to set the Arduino parameters. I'll start with a proportional gain of 1 and set the others to 0. Now I'll set a target current of 500 milliamps and then compute the control signal using the eValu method. The duty cycle is set equal to the control signal, but limited to the minimum and maximum duty. Let's see if it works. Okay, so it's not my best controller, but we can fix this. The issue is that the controller is unstable. I can stabilize the system by decreasing the proportional gain to 0.001. Better, but now there's steady state error. Using an integral controller instead of a proportional one will remove the steady state error. Ah, much better. This looks good, but let's test it in another scenario. If clouds cover the solar panel, the supply current will drop below the target. When the sun comes back out, the supply increases again. When it does, the integral controller vastly overshoots the target. Why? The problem is that the integral term accumulates error over time, so while the supply was low, a lot of error was accumulated. All that accumulated error has to be used up, meaning that the controller takes a long time to return to the right duty cycle. This error accumulation is known as windup. We can fix this using an anti-windup technique. One anti-windup method is clamping. When the duty cycle reaches its maximum, we will clamp the integral error, so no additional error is accumulated. In my PID control code, I'll add parameters for the maximum and minimum control signal value. In this case, those are maximum and minimum values of the duty cycle. Then I'll use an if statement to identify when the duty has reached a limit. If a limit is reached, no additional error will be added, preventing windup. Otherwise, the error is accumulated as before. Let's test it. You can see that the integral error stops accumulating when the duty cycle is maximum. Now the controller responds much more quickly when the supply returns because it doesn't have all that accumulated error to unwind. It's actually happening. We're going to charge the battery. I'll swap in a set of 82400 milliamp hour nickel metal hydride AA batteries for the load. Now I'll set the target current to 500 milliamps, which is about 0.2 C, and start charging. Looks okay so far. Here's the charging curve over about 5 hours. You can see the characteristic increase in voltage as the battery charges, followed by a slight dip in the voltage. This occurs when the batteries are fully charged. With the tests and design complete, we can bring our Arduino charger out into the wild to soak up some sun. Well, almost. To complete the setup, I've added 
a buck converter to power the Arduino safely from the batteries, a DS18B20 temperature sensor to monitor the battery temp, an SD card module to record charging data, an OLED display for monitoring the system, an Arduino Mega because the Uno ran out of memory, and a solar panel for obvious reasons. Let's watch. You can see that the temperature starts to rise when the battery is fully charged. Because the battery is full, it has to shed the extra energy as heat. For this test, I simply set the Arduino to stop charging at 105 degrees Fahrenheit. This is not a very good criterion. You'd want to set up a couple charging stages at least, but that's a topic for another video. If your only goal is to charge some batteries, you're better off buying an off-the-shelf charger. But, if you're a die-hard DIYer like me, I hope this gives you some ideas for how to make your own.